to people from a lot of parts of the world that we have the pleasure to share with them our passion that is the shockwaves. I'm Dr. Gilo from Chile, from the southern part of the world, working a lot of years in this, and I'm a member and past president of OLAT, the uh, Ibero-American Federation of uh, uh, Tissue Engineering and Shockwaves. And today we are continuing our uh, webinars to, uh, to interchange knowledge with people of all the world. Today we have the second webinar that we have done monthly. We, we, we think that we are going to continue doing five of these webinars of each part of our body where we can use short waves. And today we are going to continue with the uh, upper limb extremity uh, and the treatments that we can do with this. We have the honor today to have in our, between our participants, the best of, in my point of view, the best of this um, uh, people doing this in, in, uh, in a lot of parts of the world. Uh, we have our president from Argentina, Dr. Moya, is an, ex an expert in shoulder. We have the pleasure to have our friend, Sergei Thiele from Germany, that is the cradle of the study of the, of the um, shockwaves. He and his father that have the pleasure that I, I knew his father, that he was a great, uh, a great participant in all the, the knowledge of this of this technology. Then we have another great participant, our friend Karsten Noglos from Germany too. He is a, a, an expert in hand and also in aesthetics. And also from, uh, from South Korea, uh, my new friend, Park uh, Kaosung, that he is going to speak us about trigger points. We have also the, uh, a very important uh, a person from us, that is Dr. Ram Chivandram from India. He is going to present his uh, beginning, his uh, experience in shockwaves, but he is going to present how he's doing this in India. So I, I only have to say hello to everybody. Thank you to be here. And I will uh, ask our president, Dr. Moya, to begin his uh, presentation and our um, improvement improvement of knowledge that we need for everybody of you. Please, Dr. Moya, I give you the word. Thank you. Thank very you much. Be very much, Leonardo. As you said, we have friends from all over the world because I must confess that in some way, this is also a meeting of friends who have not seen each other for a long time. Uh, we have, as you said, Dr. Kwang Sung from Seoul, Republic of Korea. We have Dr. Ram Chidambaram from Chennai, the uh, east coast of India. Uh, our friend, Dr. Ashok uh, from uh, Mumbai. We have Dr. Sergei Tile from Berlin. We have Dr. Karsten Nobloch from Hanover. Dr. Sergio Rowinski from uh, Brazil, who is going to be kind of uh, the, the, the guy from outside that is going to ask us, he's an orthopedic surgeon, a great shoulder surgeon. He will ask us uh, and discuss with us the results we are showing. Uh, you, Dr. Leonardo Gilo from Chile and myself from Buenos Aires. I am very happy to, to be part of this webinar. Uh, and I want to thank OrthoTV for the support that we always receive from this organization. In my case, I will speak about shoulder pathology. And uh, we all know that shoulder pain is a reason for patients coming to our offices all over the world. It's one of the most frequent causes of pain in the musculoskeletal system. But even though most of the cases that we face are uh, functional problems, we must know that there are different injuries uh, as rotator cuff tears, and sometimes these pathologies are tricky. 
This is a case I received at my office, a 67 years old patient with diagnosis of rotator cuff tear that we can see on the MRI in the left side. This person had two indications of arthroscopic repair by two different surgeons and one indication for open repair. And he came to my office to have a second opinion, let's say a fourth opinion, and uh, to, to decide if open or arthroscopic surgery. And I saw the rotator cuff tear, but I also saw the shape of the humeral head. And I asked the patient x-rays and a scintigraphy. And in fact, what the patient had was a prostate cancer metastasis and would have been a disaster to operate on this shoulder. So the same applies to shockwaves. Uh, to have a shockwave device or a, a device of um, radial pressure waves does not make us or transform us in specialists of a topic. So we must also be very aware of these situations and no, do not treat symptoms. We must treat diagnosis. Said that, we must uh, emphasize that according to the use of uh, shock waves and radial pressure waves in, in shoulder tendinopathies, we have two main indications, calcified tendinopathies and non-calcified tendinopathies. Calcified tendinopathies have uh, I think that's very good for us that the, the, the tissue have regeneration capacity. And this is demonstrated because sometimes it is spontaneous with, with, without our intervention. But non-calcified tendinopathies, tendinopathies that are related with the generative process, uh, have a limited regeneration capacity. And we must know that and we must uh, decide in which cases it's worth to go ahead with a treatment that is not invasive and regenerative, regenerative and when it is not a good idea to do so and we need to choose another option. Speaking about calcification of the rotator cuff, this is the typical image. Most of the locations are on the supraspinatus, but we have seen calcifications in the infraspinatus, in the teres minor, and uh, more frequently than in the teres minor, in the subscapularis. It has been described, as I said, that this is a self-limited process in some patients. We began from a normal tendon, at one moment, we don't know why, there is a metaplasia of the tenocytes that become uh, chondrocytes, and we uh, have the appearance of vesicles with uh, hydroxyapatite crystals uh, in the cytoplasm of these cells. And so we can see in the calcific stage on the x-rays, uh, the presence of the calcification. This phase can last a long time and in some specific cases, there is a resorption, resorption a, spont a, spontaneous, a spontaneous resorption of the calcification, and we go back to the normal tendon. So by definition, it would be a self-limited pathology, but the point is that this does not happen in most of the patients. Many patients stay in the calcific stage, so, in those cases is where we uh, participate trying to move on the situation. What about the symptoms? Generally in the precalcification phase, people are asymptomatic and there are not X-ray changes. In the calcification or formative stage, we have variable symptoms, but generally they are comparing to uh, what we used to call an impingement, impingement syndrome. They are chronic symptoms, not sharp pain. Uh, but for those pa patients that go to the reabsorptive phase, uh, sometimes there is a very acute and sharp pain that is very difficult to manage. And that is called the colic of the shoulder. It's comparing with the pain of a heart attack. It's very, very intense. And finally, 
we must stress that there is a post-calcification phase in which even though the calcification has disappeared, for some time the pain remains. And it is good for us to know this because uh, for the beginner, the beginners, you will be surprised that in some patients you treat the patient with shock waves, the calcification disappears, but the pain remains. And that's not a problem. Generally, it takes one to two months for the pain to disappear. We can classify the calcification according to their size. And we speak about with the boss workers classification, tiny when they are barely perceptible, medium when they are less than 1.5 centimeters and large from 1.5 centimeters up. But a classification that is very useful for us to make decisions in the treatment and to have an idea of the prognosis is the Gerner classification. In these classifications, type one, as you can see, are classifications that are very dense uh, with sharp borders, homogeneous uh, content, and this is a uh, a classification in an initial phase. Then we have the type two, that there are two possible uh, alternatives. One is to see a classification that has an homogeneous content, but the borders are not clear, or just the opposite, clear borders with a, an heterogeneous content. And these classifications are more advanced in time that the type one, but they are still far from disappearing spontaneously. And then you have the, the type three that are really very transparent, uh, translucent uh, calcifications. And these type of calcifications are very close to disappear spontaneously. So generally we do not proceed with any kind of treatment besides treating the symptoms. Sometimes, this stage can last a little more than we expect. And in those cases, perhaps the use of shock waves to make it uh, more fast, uh, to make faster the disappearance could be an option, but it's not common. We also can use ultrasound that is very sensible for the diagnosis of calcifications, but the problem is that it, is, it has not a prognosis prognostic value at the x-rays. And MRIs are good to rule out associated pathology, but they are not the best way to diagnose calcification. Sometimes they uh, do not look clear in uh, this pathology, the calcifications in this kind of uh, studies. The classical therapeutic alternatives were rehab, subacromial corticosteroids, percutaneous needling aspiration and lavage, uh, lavage what the uh, French used to call barbotage. Uh, now in the last years, ultrasound guided needling has become very popular. And of course, open or arthroscopic surgery. What about rehab? Well, it, it was stated that their results of rehab were very good. But some authors have pointed out that even though we can have uh, initially uh, good results, there is a deterioration of the numbers with time. Uh, after one year, we went from 85% of good results to 60% of good results. And in many cases, it becomes as a chronic pain that is coming and going and the people uh, live with uh, their pain that is not acute but is always there. There are some uh, negative prognostic factors that can show us that the patient has not a big chance of good results with rehab and one of them is the presence of bilaterally uh, Calcification, bilateral calcifications. Uh, generally, those patients have two times more um, options of having a bad result with rehab. Another thing to consider, and as you can see, we can um, evaluate and see these prognostic factors just with x rays, is a high volume of the calcific deposits the medial extension of the calcification 
going beyond the acromioclavicular joint is another uh, pr bad pro or negative prognostic factor. And finally, the location in the anterior portion of the acromion, what we can see here as the area zero. In those cases, uh, we can expect not as good results as we can expect with rehab in other type of patients. When we did not have shockwaves, that was in my case 20 years ago, uh, I decided surgery when there was a failure of conservative treatment, when there was a symptomatic progression, on, or when I was dealing with a constant and unmanageable pain in the patient. In those cases, we decided uh, generally to go ahead for open or arthroscopic surgery. But after shockwaves appears, uh, we change our indications. And we know now yeah. that uh, the use of focus shockwaves in patients with calcifications is an approved standard indication by the International Society of Medical Shockwave Treatment because there is enough amount of um, evidence in the literature, in the scientific literature, to support this. Uh, we perform a study, a review study, uh, with a group of colleagues, including you, Leonardo, that were, was, uh, this paper was published in the, at the International Journal of Surgery in 2015. And uh, we evaluate the information in the literature, and we concluded that this is a non-invasive, safe, effective, and efficient method, as I will show you later. In 2018, we published uh, this paper at the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, uh, uh, making an analysis of the um, results according to the literature. We also use the grade of recommendation proposed by this uh, publication. And we found that for the treatment of calcific tendinopathy of the shoulder with focus shock waves, there is a grade A recommendation. That means that there is high level of scientific evidence and we should move from our uh, classical method of treatment to this new one. We have seen that uh, the good results are related with high energy. So there is no uh, good, the, we cannot support the, the use of radial pressure waves so far, at least for massive use, because the, the information that we got in the scientific um, publications is uh, insufficient. So, uh, we have more evidence for high level of energy and for focus shock waves. These are three papers. The first one is a comparison between shock waves and open surgery. The one in the center is a comparison between arthroscopy and um, the use of shock waves. And they demonstrated that shock waves are equivalent to surgery. Um, uh, the results are comparable, but what we see in the third paper on the right side is uh, one uh, paper that we presented at the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow in Jeju, Korea in 2016 with Silvia Ramon and the group of Kiron, where we demonstrated that the use of shockwave is not only effective, it's also efficient because we save from six to seven times the amount of money comparing with arthroscopic surgery with similar results. We always include a rehab program because shock waves do not, uh, does not, sorry, um, give a solution for scapular dyskinesia, for um, stiffness of the shoulder or muscle atrophy. So we need always to include a rehab program. And these are some cases to show you before and after, as you can see here, with three sessions of shockwaves, uh, the results are very, very uh, surprising. And of course, we 
not always get this, but we get this in an amount of 60 to 70 percent in which completely disappears the calcification. We have another group of patients in which the calcification disappears partially. And we have some patients in which calcifications do not disappear. I have had patients with the same calcification in both shoulders. I treated both shoulders with the same device, with the same dose, and I got the resor resorption in one side and no resorption in the other side. I have no response for the reason. Uh, there are side effects like syncope. We have had syncope in some uh, patients. Uh, the, it's very sensible, the area, the area for some patients. We have had erythema. I have seen patients like the one I'm showing you with a hematoma, and this patient was treated with a device that was a radial pressure device by someone who had no experience. And of course, acute, acute pain sometimes related to the acute resorption of the calcification. So we can tell you about the use of shock waves in calcifications of the rotator cuff, that the, there is a lot of evidence supporting this, uh, not being an invasive method, it is our first choice when rehab has failed. And um, it is efficient. Um, to treat and to uh, give the patient a good solution. What about non-calcific tendinopathies? Well, the situation in this is completely different. Uh, we can see in the literature many review papers showing that there is no evidence. We can uh, see uh, even systematic reviews with no a meta-analysis with no clear results in the use of shock waves and radial pressure waves in non-calcific tendinopathies of the shoulder. In the paper I showed you before, the result for the use both of focus and radial waves uh, in non-calcific tendinopathies of the shoulder was grade C. That means that the, there is controversial information in the literature. But one of the points that I would like to make is that calcification is a very clear diagnosis. And non-calcific tendinopathies, we all, are, after 50 years old, have a non calcific tendinopathies of the shoulder. But we do not know if it is the reason for pain or not. There have been described more than 90 differential diagnoses for shoulder pain. So I feel, and we make an analysis of, with uh, Silvia Ramon and uh, with Federico Alfano that we presented at the ISMT uh, Congress in San Sebastian, in which we analyzed the papers in favor or against the use of waves in non-calcific tendinopathies of the shoulder and the quality of those papers is bad because it, the, they have no clear inclusion or exclusion criteria. Uh, the diagnosis of the pathology is not done according to the parameters of shoulder uh, surgeon point of view. There are many things that are not clear so we cannot expect to have good results with meta-analysis or reviews uh, of papers that specifically are not well done. So uh, we cannot recommend the use of uh, pressure, uh, radial pressure waves and shock waves uh, in a massive way for patients with non-calcific tendinopathies. Even if we look at, at the protocols of these papers. Uh, you can see in red the ones that are against the use, with the, that have bad results. In green, the, the ones with good results. And you can see, for instance, if we analyze the interval for applying waves, there you go from three days to 14 days. If we analyze the number of sessions, they go from two to six. The number of pulses from 700 to 3,000, the dose from 0 0.01 millijoules 
from 0 0.78 millijoules and the frequency from 2 hertz from 12 hertz. So it is impossible, uh, even if we consider the protocols, to give uh, a recommendation. So uh, there is lack of compelling evidence to support the use of uh, radial pressure waves and shock waves in uh, non-calcific tendinopathies of the shoulder, so we cannot recommend against or in favor of it uh, the use so far. We hope we will get better information in the future. And to finish, uh, I give you an advance of the next uh, webinar. We will have it on July 17th, including a very high level doctors as today uh, speaking in this case about lower limb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Moya, for your interesting conference. But uh, today we, we need to learn more and more and we have to discuss more and more. So for, uh, for that reason, we have people that uh, can tell us by the point of view that they don't do uh, shockwaves, uh, but they do other treatments, which is the you're thinking about this pathology, the calcifying tendinopathy and the non-confident calcifying tendinopathy, uh, how we can do other treatments that we can be uh, as a sex successful as Daniel showed us with uh, shockwaves. And uh, especially, I want to ask Dr. Robinski, uh, which is your, your thoughts about this conference and what would you do with the Garner 3? For example, Garner 3, that is the only indication that we do, uh, tendi uh, calcified tendinopathy. What would you do, Dr. Robinski? Well, uh, so this answer is not difficult to me. Just for the audience to know, I'm Dr. Sergio Rovinsky from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, and I am a shoulder and elbow surgeon who does obviously a, a lot of shoulder and elbow uh, medical work for 17 years. So having said that, so whenever I have such a, a case, the first thing is, is that I really have to understand if we are talking about a, a real calcific tendonitis or not because we have to remember that as per the literature, 75% of the calcifications of the subacromial space, they are not calcific tendonitis. They are innocent bystanders that they are over there for a lot of time. So we have to first, uh, as Dr. Daniel said, establish a proper diagnosis with a clinical history and with the epidemiological data, okay? but. But uh, when I pick up a case like, like that, and when I understand from a, a, a clinical point of view and a radiological point of view that I'm talking about a calcific ten tendonitis, especially uh, a hydrographical point of view, uh, my, uh, the way I have been managing these cases for 15 years is with subacromial injections. And they get better and they really get better a lot. And then I follow them for a lot of time, and I follow them from a clinical point of view and from a hydrographical point of view, and I always expect that not only they do uh, better in, in the clinical aspect, but that the the uh, that all of the calcifications will disappear over time in serial X-ray analysis. And believe me, it happens. Uh, hopefully in the vast majority of the times. So subacromial injections have been my choice for 15 years. And I had some, I would say that six or seven times in my life, I received patients uh, in the acute phase. And as Dr. S uh, Daniel was mentioning, the pain is very strong. It's like the heart attack of the shoulder and they always want to go to the emergency. So when they come to me, I do immediately a subacromial injection with a six or seven cc of xylocaine. I wash all of the inflamed bursa on the subacromial space and they really do get better and they get better very fast. And I follow them for a, 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 a lot of, of time. Uh, so this is how I manage them. And I have been successful, but 
I've been hearing for a lot of time about uh, shockwave therapy for that, and it's always on my mind if my injections possibly doesn't work. But I have a question the, uh, to Dr. Daniel and even to you, sir, which is quite, I would say, it's uh, written in my mind during all of this lovely lecture from Dr. Daniel, which is when you pick up these patients, these uh, 40, 45, uh, white year old ladies, because it's much more common in uh, white women in from 40 to 50, okay? Uh, in the explosive phase, they are crying, literally crying of pain. So there is something that people do, which is the barbotage, which I don't do, which is very common in literature. I do the subacromial injections uh, with six or seven cc of xylocaine, I wash all the, all the bursa and it works. But when you pick up these ladies in the explosive phase in which they are with so much desperation and pain, do you think that exactly in this phase, which is very difficult for the patient, there is a role for shockwave therapy exactly in this phase of the disease. I would really like to know from Dr. Daniel and from you, sir, uh, not in the chronic phase, I know it works, but in, this, in, in, the, in the explosive phase in which is very, the pain, is, the pain drives the lady crazy. In my case, excuse me, Daniel, please, uh, let me uh, answer this first. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. The, the first thing, uh, Sergio, is uh, we have to divide the risk of our treatments. Sure. When we use non-invasive regenerative medicine that are uh, our uh, energies applied to the cell that can make the cell response, you don't have uh, possibilities, for example, of an, ex uh, an infection. Sure. That is one of the most terrible enemies in orthopedic surgery. Sure. So first, when we start a treatment, we have to think about the risk that the patient is uh, having. Second, in our techniques nowadays, we have another techniques that, techniques that are not shock waves that can uh, make us uh, uh, put the pain less. For example, we use photons and laser of high energy. In my case, I use laser when I have that cases that you are, you are telling me. And after that, when the pain goes down, I use shock waves because we have two problems. We have the inflammation of the barsa and we have the tendinopathy with the change of the cell. And when we use both techniques, you can avoid the risk of putting a needle inside. And if we fail in that, we can continue with the semi-invasive regenerative medicine as you can do uh, putting inside some, uh, some um, uh, lidocanin or some anesthetic. So the risk is, the, is in the following step. And if everything fails, you can do the third stage. That is the invas in the invasive uh, technologies as a troscope Atroscopy or surgery. Sure, so sure. the problem is to understand the risk. And that's why I don't think that starting with an, uh, a semi invasive treatment is a good idea. Not, it's, it's not a bad treatment. It's not a good idea. Excuse me, Daniel, that was my, my point of view. No, I perfect, to... perfect. I, I think that this is a very good question, and your response is complementary to what I was going to say. It's perfect. In, generally, I uh, consider that if a patient is coming with that kind of uh, clinical findings, uh, it's because is going through the re spontaneous resorption of the calcification in many times. So it wouldn't make sense to me to, to do a treatment in which uh, what is going, what I'm looking for, is, it, it is what is going on spontaneously. So uh, what I try to do with this patient is to control pain 
um, I prefer to use corticoids uh, in in the gluteus because the the risk is much lower, and it has been demonstrated by some papers that the level of analgesia that you get comparing the injection in the subacromial space with the gluteus is the same, okay. and the level of risk is much less. So I control pain and I follow up the patient with x-rays. If I see that it's disappearing, perhaps in two, three weeks, the calcification will disappear most of it spontaneously. And if, the, if I see that the pain is controlled and the calcification does not move on, perhaps I can push it with a couple of sessions of shock waves. Uh, can, I, can I make a, a comment? Can I? Sure. Sure, okay. please. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I am getting all of this information. I am learning with you and with Dr. Daniel for sure. But there is one thing that I want to comment, okay? Because when you have the, I, I am still insisting in the explosive phase, which is not, we don't see every day, but this woman, they come desperate to the office. I have seen it almost 10 times in my life. And as I teach my, my residents, they want to bang the head on the wall. They are desperate. They come always crying. So literature is quite, uh, I would say, uh, it's quite evident about the fact that we have a phenomena which is called exudatus. The exudatus that comes from the explosive phase in which you have a, a gigantic inflammation of the bursa. This is what we, the subacromial bursa, this is what we call bursal leaders. And you see the idea of washing all of that with xylocaine and dismantling that, it's quite interesting. And I would still, and I would still say that uh, an injection is invasive, but if you do it properly in the office with, with, with asepsia, I don't know how to say Daniel, asepsia uh, in English, but you understand me. You know, if you clean everything with stereo uh, instruments, blah, 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 it's still very safe. And, uh, and all of this washing of the subacromial bursa can only happen if you are doing a subacromial injection. So, uh, uh, to, 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 so in other words, when you do uh, corticoids in the gluteus, you only have the pharmacological effect, the systemical pharmacological effect of the corticoid. But when you do it here, you have this, not a systemical effect, a local effect with a mechanical effect of dismantling all of the bursal leaders. So it's different, okay? From, and uh, what's happening is different and it makes sense in my mind. So having said that, in spite of the fact that Dr. Daniel said that the results are the same in the gluteus and in, in the subacromial space, don't you think that there are very serious and real advantages of doing what I do uh, on the acute phase? I'm not being provocative, okay? I don't want to uh, uh, tease anyone. I am just being thoughtful about all of these practical ideas and again, these patients, they come desperate to the office. So I, I want to give them in the office, in the, in the clinic, what would be the most powerful uh, option in my hands. But I guess I, I, I made interesting comments and I, I would like to hear you guys. And even if Dr. Ham has something to say, uh, we would love to- I, I, will, I will just- uh, answer you to so we can move on uh, not to get late yeah. but okay. I think that it's a very interesting topic and I could also uh, respond you well but you are adding one more trauma uh, okay. putting a, a needle in an area where is inflammation but I think it's a very interesting topic. In fact, we are planning with uh, the Greek friends uh, uh, this a mini battle comparing yeah. Uh, yeah. the uh, subacromial injections with shock waves. And so I think uh, it's a topic, Sergio, that is very practical in everyday practice and we can discuss it. It, it could be a reason for a specific webinar. 
But I think that uh, I agree with you, and I am sure that you have good results with that method. And sometimes there are different ways to get to the to the same result. Sure, it's very interesting this topic. So I, it's very interesting to hear another people talking, not only us, Daniel. <laughs> we we have to ask <laughs> Ram. Ram is is a, is a raising the hand. So uh, Ram, yes. what do you think about this? And also Karsten, and also Sergey. Yes. And also, yes, Park. I'm, I'm a participant. Okay. I'm a high volume uh, uh, shoulder elbow surgeon, practiced in UK for 12 years and now currently for the last 10 years in India. But I'm a big proponent of shockwave as well, <laughs> a contrasting person. Uh, basically, in the UK, we have done a lot of uh, arthroscopic surgeries for uh, calcific deposit. We, in fact, reviewed over uh, 40 to 60 patients. And we found that the proportion of them, when you do arthroscopic excision, they have a residual defect because you are removing. So the concept of uh, shockwave is that you heal the tissue and you allow some regeneration to happen. So you avoid this residual uh, weakness or defect in the rotator cuff. So sure. that was the only thing which was uh, uh, attractive uh, to us. So myself and my colleague Daniel Box started to use in UK. They have used both focus and uh, radial shortwave, more of focus. Now, um, what I want to, um, my comment about that staging, it is not like frozen shoulder because we have calcific deposit. But at the same time, you have a liquefaction and amorphous deposit, patient comes with acute pain. In my practice, I just control the pain for uh, with whatever measures we do for two, three days time. And when it's settled down, we can go ahead with our regular protocol of whatever your favorite non-invasive treatment of choice. Mm -hmm. so it is not going through a strict phase. You always have a calcific deposit, liquefaction deposit has, has sclerosed again, and the whole symptoms can recur again. So uh, that's one thing. Second thing, I want to ask one uh, question to Daniel. Even in my practice, even if you see the uh, there is still persisting calcification or no complete uh, disappearance, the patients are still much better with shockwave therapy. Symptomatically, range of movement, pain-wise. So uh, only about 10% uh, of patients do have persisting problem. They require surgical intervention when you start to adapt this in the general use. Is there any uh, factor in your practice you found? Uh, these are the particular group of patients. They did not do well with shockwave. Well, I completely agree with you. Our uh, results when we made a review some years ago uh, uh, was that when the calcification disappeared, practically 100% of the cases have a, a very clear recovery. When we got uh, disappearance that was uh, clear but was not complete, was more than 50% but was not complete, 76% of the patients were very happy with the result, even though the complete calcification was had not disappeared. And when we got no changes, I could tell you that from 5 to 10% of the patients are happy. But for me, there is a correlation between the amount of disappearance of the calcification with the clinical result. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that we have, uh, th this discussion is very interesting. Uh, I have another opinions to do, but I think that we have uh, to continue. So uh, I would like to continue with the second uh, conference that will be done by Sergei Thiele from Germany. He is going to uh, teach us uh, how to do shockwaves in the, sh in the shoulder, but excuse me, in the elbow. Uh, People that want to do questions, please uh, put it in the chat. We were going to uh, do the questions at the end of all the conferences. Uh, so uh, you can do it with, in the, the chat of the webinar, please. And we are going to read it after all the conference. Uh, Sergey, please. Thank you, Leonardo. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for the invitation, actually. Um, it's very nice to have in this time these uh, webinars in order to get somehow the meeting point and so hopefully we will meet together in person soon but uh, so far I'm very happy that online is doing things like that. 
So, well, what I will talk about is the treatment of the elbow. And first of all, I have to say that uh, there's no conflict of interest. Um, and what I want to tell you is how uh, uh, the treatment was uh, developed and how I am doing it uh, nowadays. So the tennis elbow is more accurately described and understood as a, um, a tendinopathy of the lateral elbow. And it is a process of a failed healing affecting the common extensor tendon. So it's characterized by a chronic degeneration at the origin of the extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It is usually caused by injury or overuse. These injuries are mainly small injuries and repetitive strain injuries. So one of the, the most common tendinopathies of the upper extremity and an annual incidence of one to 3% of the total, total population. Let me see whether I can don't get it now. So what we are doing is that we do a clinical examination and taking a look on the uh, rest pain uh, doing extension, the so-called Thompson test. We make a palpation on the radial epicondyle. We have a finger test. We have the pain on the turbination and we take a look for the range of motion and of course the decrease of uh, grip strength and a pain at rest and during the night. But as well, we can see differences in the ultrasound, especially in the power doppler. Uh, we can see the different uh, situation of the, uh, of the uh, inflammation and that's where we can somehow make an answer about how the treatment will work. But of course, we as well have the MRI in order to see these structures and as of course, see different differential diagnosis on this uh, more or less clinical examination of the shoulder uh, elbow pain. So here is the uh, MRI of the edema showing the uh, lateral epicondylus. So what are the treatment options so far? We have the normal conservative treatment that are in use like rest and movement restriction and application of ice, hot and cold treatment. We have analgesic uh, medication with uh, uh, non-steroidal antirheumatics, uh, taking it orally or topically. And we have, of course, orthopedic devices. There was already uh, uh, in former times a um, review on the or attempted meta-analysis, I should say, as the author said it as well, uh, of the treatment options on the epicondylitis of the elbow. And it showed a very sad uh, uh, treatment options. So there's physiotherapy and, of course, the eccentric training and stretching ultrasound showing not so good results. And what we can see often are the cortical uh, injection, which uh, in my view should never ever be performed. Then of course, PRP will uh, rise and is rising already. And the surgery uh, is always an option after failed conservative treatment. But then of course there's ESWT and Therefore, uh, we will talk about the options, what is the possibility on ESWT. So in the beginning of the 1990s, extracorporeal shockwave therapy found its way to the orthopedic treatment procedures and epicondylitis was one of the first and obviously most successful treatment indications for ESWT. There were a number of RCTs that were performed showing the efficacy of the treatment. And for instance, the FDA approval in the US was one of the first after the uh, plantar fasciitis. So the ESWG showed to be safe, non-invasive, easy to apply. We heard about that already before, uh, being non-invasive and an easy to apply treatment option should be one that should be well tolerated by the patient. 
But of course, there are high quality studies that showed not as strong results in comparison to the placebo as expected. So the role of ESWT for uh, epicondylitis had to be discussed again. And we are somewhere in between, not markedly different from placebo and highly effective and reasonable alternative to a surgery. So what we did uh, some years ago in, in the International Journal of Surgery and uh, uh, Special Edition, uh, we did a review show, taking a look on how the, uh, the uh, scientific uh, situation is. And what we thought was there were, were a number of negative RCTs by crowds of speed and Millikan, but as well uh, that could be included. We had a number of positive RCTs. And these uh, were like uh, from Rompel, uh, who, uh, who performed it and developed the, the, uh, uh, his work on uh, seeing a lot of positive results. Petroni, Spaka, Radwan, Gündems, uh, they were included and there are still some more to come. So what Rompe could show that was in a, in a uh, quite big uh, group, 78%, uh, 78 patients, uh, in two groups with the shockwave and the placebo group, that the shockwave was showing a significant benefit in the uh, in, in order to, to the to the sham group, and uh, so therefore this was quite a reasonable idea on treating these patients like that. So what already is to be seen is that he was uh, always treating without a local anesthesia but we will see that later on. Petroni was uh, doing an even higher number of patients with 114 patients in two groups uh, divided in the placebo and shockwave group and as well was able to show in a 12 uh, week follow-up a, a significant uh, bettering of the uh, grip strength and less pain. For the radial shockwave or pressure wave, however you will call them, uh, they, it could as well be shown uh, very good results in the SPACA work uh, with 62% uh, patients uh, showing a decrease of pain and, and functional impairment and an increase of the pain-free grip strength. So therefore, radial shockwave uh, showed to be safe and effective as well. In former times to in 2020, uh, in quite comparable work was uh, published by Zhao and Chen, showing that according to the pooled uh, results, uh, the early recovery from pain was accelerated by the VAs and measured uh, therefore and the grip uh, strength. And the uh, authors concluded that based on the existing clinical evidence, extracorporeal shockwave therapy can effectively relieve the pain and functional impairment caused by tennis elbow, which better overall safety than uh, several other methods, especially the corticosteroid injection. So for the patients unresponsive to conventional treatment methods, clinicians should consider shockwave therapy as possible alternative. So what I already mentioned was the uh, lack of using uh, local anesthesia and Labeck et al. showed in a, in a work that, uh, that showed a negative influence using a local anesthesia to the treated area. And therefore we uh, always try to avoid these. Um, the local anesthesia seems to inhibit the C fiber activity and therefore substantially uh, alter the biologic response to the shock wave. So therefore, don't ever use uh, local anesthesia in the treated area that you're going to treat. So after these uh, controversial ideas about using or not using the shock waves, uh, we do see good results. And I do think, and I'm very keen on uh, hearing what 
uh, the park is telling us later on as well about the myofascial situation and Sylvia Ramon uh, had done very interesting work on the myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia and showing there the, these areas and what I do therefore is as well that I do treat the muscle in combination to the uh, treatment with the shockwave therapy. So therefore I as well do a chiropractic access on, on my patients. And then afterwards, I do the uh, shockwave treatment, maybe even combined with the acupuncture needle. And if I go here, you can see it. As I go to the uh, uh, interesting area, then I do see that the needle is vibrating much more than it did before. So therefore, I do think that this is are uh, showing some uh, results because before I was already treating the muscle and it should uh, make a movement as well. So after all, what do I do? I do some combinations. I do a, a, a light treatment with a focus device. And then I do a myofascial pain uh, treatment on the, the uh, uh, according muscles. And after all, then I teach my patients with the self-exercise, doing eccentric load strengthening and uh, strength training uh, together. So after these, uh, I do see very good results overall. So thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward for your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sergey. Very interesting, your, your conference. And uh, before uh, doing the, a question to uh, our friend Sergio Rubinsky that uh, could uh, tell us how he do this, I will make some, a, a little comment. I'm hearing well, in all the conferences, in all the conferences that we talk about epicondylitis. And my, my um, way of saying this, that is a, a tendinosis of extensor tendons. Why? we continue uh, talking about epicondylitis and not epicondylopathy because when we uh, think about inflammation, we think about steroids, for example, inside the, the tendon. And uh, uh, before doing the question to Sergio, why, Sergey, you tell us that it's a epicond epicondylitis and not epicondylopathy? You think that is not a tendinosis of the extensor tendons? I do think that it is an uh, it is an uh, tendinosis of the of the attachment. Of course, I do, and I do uh, treat it as one in order to uh, get a detonization of the muscle as well. But as well, I do see an inflammation at the point. So therefore. Uh, I was taking a look on the on the uh, Doppler ultrasound in order to to see these inflammatory uh, uh, vessels there, uh, showing us that there is inflammatory uh, situation. We do have an edema uh, that cannot be uh, discussed as well. So um, no, I really I I do see the point that we do have to treat the situation why this, uh, this uh, attachment is uh, uh, seriously um, in, in, in trouble, but, uh, but I don't want to make a, a, a change of the nomenclature as well. So therefore, no. <laughs> okay. Some authors say that that vessels that you see in the echograph in the echography are uh, are anormal vessels are not inflammatory yeah. there yeah so i think that that discussion would uh, be for a webinar also so it's, it's not, <laughs> my my idea is to continue so i will ask uh, sergio you think that this is, a, is it an inflammation you use cortic uh, corticosteroids what do you do you operate these cases you think that this is a self limited uh, um, disease what is your, your thought, uh, not about SBT? Okay, so the thing is, first of all, I love to discuss this. I love. 
Second, I would like to have two hours only to discuss lateral epicondylitis. I would love to, because I, I have a lot of things to say. Unfortunately, we don't have time, but I am suggesting you, sir, to do a webinar only on that, because we see new cases every day. And I started to listen to this 17 years ago when I started my shoulder and elbow practice, and I'm listening to the same story. and because we have the questions, but we don't have the answers. So having said that, before telling what I do, let me give you some very fast thoughts. The first one is, there is a classical description that the disease is not inflammatory, that it would be only angiofibroblastic tissue. I don't believe that because, uh, I use it to send, when I operated more many years ago, all of this, uh, the, the tissue to, to anatomopathological analysis. And it was always written by the anatomopathologist that there, there was inflammatory tissue and inflammatory re reaction over there. And besides that, as Dr. Sergei has said, we see when we operate that, which is very uncommon, a lot of vascular dilatation. So there is vascular reaction over there, which show us from a macroscopic point of view that there is inflammation. So we have macroscopic uh, evidence and microscopic histo uh, anatomo histopathological evidence that there is inflammation. So in my opinion, yes, it's an inflammatory and degenerative disease. So having said that, when I have cases with mild symptoms, I always start non-invasive non methods with physiotherapy, but my practice has been, and I am very successful uh, because I don't use shockwave therapies to do something which I learned with Felix Savoy, which is a very famous shoulder guy from the United States, which is to do an injection with corticoids, with what we call the percutaneous scratching of the periosteum of the lateral epicondyle. So I enter with a little bit of xylocaine and corticoid and I scratch, I scratch the periosteum of the lateral epicondyle in order to induce bleeding. And that, and that blood would hence induce tendon healing. So, Whenever I started doing that, which was from 2012 to now, my results have been changing a lot. So I am adding corticoids with blood. So if uh, we know that the blood vascularity of the tendon, the, the, tendon, the tendons is poor. So I am adding blood to the region coming from the periosteum. And once I started doing that, my results changed tremendously. So I have been doing this and on a single shot because I don't want to put a lot of corticosteroids on the tendon. We know that. And just for you to know, sir, I don't want to be, well, I would like to talk one hour about that. But from, but from five years to now, from five years to now, there is a new product in Brazil, which is made in Switzerland, which is called Sportvis, Sportvis which is hyaluronic acid, uh, especially from, to use in tendons. And the problem is that they cost here in Brazil 30 times more than a single shot of, of corticoids. But in some cases I have been using hyaluronic acid from tendinopathies and my results have been outstanding. So, and I know that there are many studies been done now in the United States comparing the normal corticoid shots with hyaluronic acid, okay? But the problem is that uh, we are waiting for results, but besides all of this, what Dr. Daniel has highlighted in his lecture is very serious. We have to think about the costs, yeah? Because none of these things, they are free. So I have one option with the corticoid steroids with the scratching and I have, which is absolutely uh, cheap. And I have something which is the new hyaluronic acid, 
with wonderful results, but it's very expensive. So having said that, the cost benefit and the cost effectiveness, I am still a big fan of corticosteroid injections with percutaneous scratching. And uh, I would say that I operate basically zero cases, zero cases, and I get one to two new cases a week. Surgery is a super exception, super exception. And just to mention, when I do the surgery, which is very, very uncommon, I do exactly what Nirshaw says. I open, I open the, 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 the ACRL, I see the, 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 the microscopical alterations on the ECRB, and I, uh, and I uh, just close it with anchors or without anchors, but Nirshaw says, pay attention everybody, Nirshaw says that you must do on the surgery a lot of holes in the lateral epicondyle for blood to come. So it's the same idea that I do in the, in the, the percutaneous injection. So the common denominator is if you try to bring blood to the region that would be quite good for tendon healing. I have been uh, successful, successful ten, uh, managing these cases like, like that, but I am absolutely, I would say, open ears to know what you guys think about that or if you do something quite different. Thank you, Sergio. We have to, um, we have, this discussion would have, uh, each discussion we have had now, it, it could be for a webinar. Uh, sure. I'm not agree. You excuse me. I not agree with with your point of view. I think okay. that corticosteroids is not the best way to treat this okay. thing. I think that Sergey would have something to say also. But please, Sergey, answer this, and we continue then with Carson because if not, we are going to be discussing this three days. Please, Sergey. Yeah, I don't want to. I just want to make a little point as well. And yes, I do see some people who treat very effectively with the corticosteroid. If you take a look in the literature, then you see a short term effect. I don't know how these are in your case. Maybe due to your practice uh, doing some needling as well and trying to uh, uh, make a better blood flow and blood supply, you are more effective. That's possible, but I do see two aspects. I do see the bad aspect about the hyaluronic acid due to the uh, tendon and due to the uh, um, the fat pad, uh, the, the um, um, subcutaneous fat. And what I do see is these, these women, uh, beautiful women that are not uh, able to wear short anymore because they do not want to show their elbow because the skin has a dell and they have a problem there. So that's one point about the corticosteroid. The other point, and that's maybe much more my point, I do make a better uh, blood supply in the uh, area that I do treat with a shockwave that we mm -hmm. do see, and therefore I do see that is the reason why we are treating with shockwave this, this beneficial. And so therefore, I, that, that's one of the reasons why I do treat the direct area with a focus device, and then I do yes. next to it, a detonization with the, for the muscle with a the, with the radial device. A, I, I do treat the, the, the uh, information from the, from the center, and therefore, I do treat these these uh, these uh, tensions that are that are happening there, fascial treatment and stuff like that. So therefore, yeah, of course, I do see your point, but um, I'm happy that I I'm over uh, corticosteroids so far. Okay, okay. good. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Please, sir, sir, you. I, I will won't continue with this uh, with this discussion because if not, the time will pass uh, and it's late for some some of us. Uh, so, uh, uh, adding only one point, I ha we have to think that non-invasive always sure. will be better in the first sure. point from the invasive. Now we are going to go to the third point, that is uh, our friend Carsten Nordblok from uh, Germany, that are going to talk uh, about hand and his uh, uh, great uh, uh, experience of this. 
Uh, and after after all the conference, we can continue discussing for a, uh, for a while with the people of the audience. So please, Karsten, teach us about hand. Dear Leonardo. And short dear papers. Dear Leonardo, dear Daniel, thank you. It is a uh, distinct pleasure for me to participate in this very multi-international three continent or even more uh, conference now. So uh, I will start uh, on a tiny bone uh, of the wrist, the scaphoid. And the scaphoid tends to lead to non-unions because of a poor vascular supply. And the major vessel is a retrograde uh, vessel feeded uh, from branches of the radial artery. So uh, oftentimes uh, given um, bones, um, related or non-union rates are li li uh, related to poor vascular supply. And this is the case if it comes to scaphoid uh, fractures, the more proximal your fracture line is, the more likely a uh, scaphoid non-union will appear. So the area or the location of the uh, fracture is of paramount, um, is paramount in this aspect. Sergio Russo from Italy and his colleagues, Bruno Corrado and others, published in the 2000 book, Musculoskeletal Shockwave Therapy by Mr. Coombs, Wolfi Schaden and Sue, the up to date, still the by far largest cohort study on scaphoid non-unions. They included 153 patients with scaphoid non-unions. They used focused electromagnetic uh, high energetic device uh, 4,000 shots, 2,000 from the dorsal aspect, 2,000 from PIMA, and they applied 0.5 millijoule, just to remember. And they were quite successful using this high energetic approach. This was published 2000. In my uh, book, ESWT Enhanced Surgery, Sergio again, 1919 years later, wrote a chapter on scaphoid non-unions, how I do it now. And if you look in his parameters, he's still using focused electromagnetic device. However, if uh, with regards of energy flux density, he uses only 0.05 to 0.12 millijoule, so low energetic in a way. And if it if it comes or if you compare it to his approach in the late 90s, it is by tenfold less energies he's using now in contrast to 20 years before, for even better results. So maybe one has to rethink even the paradigm of very, very high energies, even on the bone. You know, and this is one of the very first reports I'm aware of, that you can be very successful even with lower energy levels. There is a another uh, study just uh, published two years ago from my first doctorate, Robert Kramer and his working group using piezo electric focus device. And they did in vivo management in uh, or measurements in healthy volunteers on the scaphoid bone perfusion. And they measured with a device called laser Doppler flowmetry, the scaphoid blood flow. And they could show that within four or five minutes after application of piezoelectric, as you see, 0.3 high energetic uh, shots, the, uh, capil uh, the capillary blood flow of the scaphoid is increased. I now introduce or just highlight a, a novel machine which we, you or I use, in addition to shockwave, it's called electro or extracorporeal magneto transduction therapy. So it is using high oscillating, very powerful magnetic fields. And this is the case, first operation scaphoid fracture, first operation 2012, second operation, again with a, a bone graft uh, and a Herbert screw in 2019. So two operations with bone grafting, no success. So in the first wave of COVID in March, 2020 in Germany, I treated him with three sessions of ESWT, high energetic and EMTT, and then did a 3D scan of his wrist. So this is the, the novel machine in combination with the shockwave. This is my 3D uh, CT scan. And this, these are the images five weeks after the three sessions. And you see now after nearly nine years of scaphoid non-unions and two failed surgeries within five weeks, a bony consolidation of a scaphoid fracture, just to give you an outlook. And this has just been published in medicine. 
Another case on metacarpal fracture, you see here the development, undergrad uh, wiring, uh, not successful, then bone graft, and uh, in my view, in my personal view, very short uh, uh, plate here, as you see here, the tiny plate with only uh, four cort or two cortices uh, taken, uh, unsuccessful in the end. Again, three sessions, focus shockwave and EMTT. You see it's here, focus shockwave, uh, the parameters high energetic, 0.35 millijoule, 4,000 shots, and 6,000 shots with the EMTT device in one session. And again, same, same imaging studies before and after within, as you see, March 20, April 30, six weeks in between. And you see here nicely this, the bone graft and the non-consolidated fracture, and then the consolidation within three, uh, six weeks. Just to give you an idea, and just has just been published in the German Hand Surgical Journal. So if it comes to thump osteoarthritis of the CMC1 joint, uh, there is the eaton littler classification, and we will hear from Park later, diagnosis, and Daniel already told us, diagnosis and localization is everything. And if it comes to bone or thump osteoarthritis, I believe it's crucial to have a very, not only locate the pain, but also the degree of osteoarthritis. And I'm using the aforementioned 3D uh, CT scan, and you can do this reformation work, as you can see here, but you can have plain scans as well. And this is, for example, just for um, uh, description purposes, a eaton littler osteoarthritis degree one. This is, for example, degree two with some subcongral sclerosis and some loose bodies smaller than two millimeters. Uh, I do it usually with both hands simultaneously, so you have a nice view on the right and left hand side. Here, a, a fourth degree eaten littler with subluxation, uh, bone to bone contact, cysts, and so on, and adjacent STT osteoarthritis. So, and this is how I describe a patient before I offer any therapy. And if it comes to osteoarthritis of the thumb, I start usually with the osteoarthritis. Uh, for six weeks. And I offer shockwave therapy, focused shockwave in this case, I will show you the data. Uh, then I offer, if, if I fail, uh, injection therapy by intra-articular so, so, uh, ultrasound-guided uh, hyaluronic acid, and finally surgery. That's my approach. And the best study I'm aware of on the osteoarthritis of the thumb is published in 2018 by an Italian group comparing three sessions of focus shockwave and intra-articular hyaluronic acid injections done by ultrasound control. So they did three sessions of focused electromagnetic shockwave, 0.09 millijoule, two, two 400 uh, impulses, three sessions, or three sessions of hyaluronic acid ultrasound guided. Um, they had included rather old patients, 68 years, and long pain durations, eight years, as you see here, and out of 10, a pain level of seven to eight. So quite impaired patients. And this is the change in the visual analog scale uh, with re regards to pain in black for the focus shockwave group in white for the hyaluronic acid group. And you see a nice response in both groups immediately four weeks after, three months after, with a tendency that at three months, the hyaluronic acid is a bit better, but at six months, the shockwave still improve and the hyaluronic acid injection group uh, declined. So maybe in that case, the three sessions of hyaluronic acid then work very good for three months and then the medical effects they exert become less relevant, as you can see here in this, in this um, chart. So another tendon disease is trigger finger. This is trigger finger of the, uh, of the thumb, of the flexor, uh, of the uh, thumb. And usually the, let's say, the sweller or the enlargement of a tendon, say an, an Achilles tendon, patella tendon, does not cause a constriction problem. However, on the finger, it does. Because if you have an enlarged tendon because of tendinopathy uh, and inflammation, and I'm 
seeing inflammation 15 years every day with power Doppler ultrasound on every tendon. So it is, in my view, a fully inf inflammatory disease uh, with some tendon changes structural wise. However, what is pain or causing the pain is inflammation. So the enlargement of the tendon is entrapped under the annular ligament. And you can now do it or visualize this by dynamic ultrasound with high resolution ultrasound. This is a 22 degree hockey stick probe I'm using on the finger for assessment of the uh, uh, dynamics of the flexor tendon. And you see here, the tendon nodule with enlargement and his in, its entrapment within the A1 uh, annular ligament. My approach in trigger finger starts with shock waves. Second is injection therapy with either, because of the swelling issue, very tiny amount of triamcinolone or hyaluronic acid or surgery at third uh, stage. We have by now five, actually another Japanese or uh, Chinese study, six studies, mainly using radial pressure wave devices. The first by Nikos Maliolopoulos published in 2014, then an RCT 216 uh, cohort study here, piezo wave and a combination of focus and radial shock wave in this group. Um, of note, the first study Nikos presented here on Shockwave Berlin in 2012. Um, he was using radial pressure wave 2000 shots, but only 0.4 bar and only very slow five hertz. So not 10, not 15, not 20 hertz, five hertz and 1.4 bars at that. So very low pressure and very slow. And he uh, was the first, as far as I oversee, even for other tendon regions, to show that the longer the duration of pain before your starting of the ESWT, the more um, sessions of shockwave, in this case, radio shock, uh, pressure wave therapy it needs. So if patients has less than three months of pain, he was successful with five sessions. If a patient has more than 12 uh, ye uh, months of pain, he needed eight sessions, just to give you an idea on how relationship is. And like the knives of the chef for different purposes in, in your given kitchen, I'm using different radial applicators, even enhanced surgical setup. For example, in trigger fingers, I'm starting with Atlas and then move on, on ceramics and maybe using even different, different tools. So I'm um, changing even my applicators within a given treatment. So shortly on the carpal tunnel syndrome, a neuropathy or compression neuropathy where the medium nerve is covered under the ligamentum carpi transversum in the carpal tunnel with adjacent nine flexor tendons. And if on the one hand, you have flexor tendinopathy with an enlargement of your tendons, the space within the carpal tunnel becomes less and there might be some compression issues. And the first study published on the use of, in that case, piezo electric focus shockwave device was published by Pietro Romeo. Um, and Christina D'Agostino in 2010. And they used very, very low energies, as you see, 0.03 uh, millijoule in patients who already underwent unsuccessful carpal tunnel uh, surgery. So in that cases, they could reduce pain levels quite significantly from six out of 10 to two out of 10 at six weeks and even further down the road. And there is a nice chapter by a Taiwanese colleague, Dr. Wu, in the ESWT book, highlighting at that point, published in 2019, the randomized controlled trials using, on the upper panel, focus shock wave, on the lower panel, radio pressure waves. And it appears that, on the one hand, clinical-wise, patients improve, uh, related to improvement in Boston uh, carpal tunnel questionnaire, which is a validated prom. Neurophysiological wise, the patients improve and even by ultrasound and you can measure some very special things like fas fascicular fasciculization and diameter changes of the, uh, of the uh, nerve, of the median nerve and they improve. So there is solid evidence even by now for 
uh, for the use of or considering shockwave therapy in carpal tunnel disease. Some last words on Dupuytren disease. So in Dupuytren, it's very crucial to differentiate uh, the nodular stage where you have only nodules and no contracture, where in Germany we offer radiation therapy or by now focus shockwave therapy. I will show you the evidence for this. And the other part is uh, caught with more than 20 degrees of joint contracture, where if patient is impaired by that contracture, we consider as the gold standard open surgery, or you, we offer percutaneous needle fasciotomy, or we consider enzymatic fasciotomy with collagenase injection. Um, we did a uh, long time ago, actually, when I was still in the hospital, but uh, published now, a study in painful nodular stage of uh, dupuytrens. We used focused electromagnetic device. It was published this January as a randomized controlled trial. And we, con we did three sessions, 0.35 millijoule, 2,000 shots, in contrast to a placebo treatment. And we measured pain reduction because we only included patients with painful nodules. And pain reduction was quite substantial. In white columns is the shockwave group, focus shockwave. In black, the placebo group. And you see a significant improvement after three sessions at three, six, 12, and 18 months, and an impairment or more pain in the placebo group. The same holds true for some patient-related outcome measures like DASH score or a Michigan hand questionnaire or the URAM scale, so all improvement proved interestingly and notably at best six months after. So it appears that even your three sessions of shockwave take some time to react in a fibrotic nodule when it comes to pain. And there was a further observation, however, this uh, was not significant, but a tendency that over a follow-up of 18 months, we had less um, interventions uh, for any dupuytren related, say, injection therapy, percutaneous nasal fasciotomy, or surgery in the intervention group in contrast to the control group. So we concluded that focused electromagnetic high energetic shockwave can significantly reduce pain in painful nodules, and we found no adverse effects. And it appears, uh, at least in the in the dupuytrens, and the same was true for lederhose of the part of the foot. Uh, that um, shockwave can uh, work antifibrotic because TGF beta expression is somehow uh, mediated or modulated. And in the end, by the modulation of TGF beta on the receptor side, less fibrosis is coming out. So the antifibrotic action of focus shockwave is mediated or modulated by TGF beta. Uh, last case. Um, 50 per, uh, degree MP co joint contracture in a female patient with chronic lymphatic leukemia during her um, chemotherapy. Uh, however, she, she neglected uh, surgery. So I did the combination of Cyapex collagenase injection, as you can see here. She was on very low platelets. So you see a large amount of inflammation in hematoma. And I'm combining radial pressure waves, focus shock waves as an anti-inflammatory uh, treatment in addition with the EMTT. And you see here on the day I did the cord breaking. So you remember 50 degree, 50 degree beforehand, immediately after and four days after a significant and very rapid um, relief of the hematoma and the inflammation by the combination of focused radio shock wave magnetotherapy. So I conclude, I highlighted shortly that shockwave in the hand can improve bone healing, which we know from long bones, but, uh, for example, on scaphoid fractures. We can improve like in the lower limb, like on the upper limb, even tendinopathies like trigger finger or de Coven. We can improve carpal tunnel syndrome and maybe even other compression therapy and neuropathies. And we can modulate and modify the cause of the disease in Dupuytrens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karsten. A very, very interesting your conference. And uh, in honor of time, I will ask all the audience to make questions because we have to continue. 
I, I excuse uh, that uh, we are not going to make a discussion in this moment because we need uh, in honor of time to continue. So uh, uh, the only thing I, I want to say that we can combine physical, physical energies to improve human tissues. And that has been demonstrated by all the conference uh, that we have here today. And now we are going to hear uh, uh, Professor Park from um, Korea that are, are going to tell us how he do in myofascial points treatments with shockwaves or with combinations that uh, he has a lot of experience. Park, please. I think it's a video that has to be put it, uh, done by uh, uh, Professor Park. Please. Uh, Thank you. So Patrick Sarazen from South Hello everyone. This, this is Dr. Kwang Sun Park, an orthopedic surgeon from South Korea. So today's topic is about treatment of trigger points around the shoulder. Has stopped, please uh, continue please with the video. Sorry, Leonardo, what's the problem? Okay. Okay. Is any problem? Can you hear? Yes, it's, no, we, we, it's not now the video in the screen. Please, put no, it no. again. Okay, I will begin again. Do not worry. Excuse to the audience. Please make some questions in the no, chat. No, it's okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Kwang Sun Park, an orthopedic surgeon from South Korea. Today's topic is about treatment of trigger points around the shoulder girdle with shock waves. I'm going to de deliver my lecture with Steko's facial manipulation concept. It might be somewhat strange and unfortunate. It doesn't hear, Daniel. It's, problem, it's a problem with the, with the video. Daniel, it's a problem with the video. Please repeat it. There's some problem. But we can hear, and, and the screen is not, the video is not in the screen. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me check it because it, it was working with no problem. Well, uh, I, sir, I'm going to. While playing the video, kindly do not uh, minimize the video. You need to just open it and do not alt, uh, do any alt tab or something, you know. Okay, okay, it, uh, we go again. Yeah, otherwise it will not show there. Yeah. yeah go ahead, Dr. Daniel. Sorry, Dr. Good. Let's check. When, okay. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Kwang Sun Park, an orthopedic surgeon from South Korea. Today's topic is about treatment of trigger points around the shoulder girdle with shock waves. I'm going to deliver my lecture with Steko's facial manipulation concept. It might be somewhat strange and unfamiliar to you in a sense. However, I believe it will be beneficial for your clinic for sure. Well, let's get it started. Today's contents. After introduction about the principles currently practicing in my clinic, I'm going to demonstrate how to diagnose based on Cyrex and Stakos methods Raggy. in this session. Please do not forget, localization is the most important concept. Lastly, after reviewing the current papers regarding ESWT using facial manipulation concept, let's go through further about new trigger points of shoulder, Stakos center of coordination points. These three slides are the most important part of the today's lecture. Here are the principles being practiced in my clinic, so also. Next, new trigger points, in other words, center of coordinations in scapula segments. Finally, center of coordination points in humerus segments. I really hope you get used to it. Well, 
let me dig into further to maximize the effect of shock wave within a limited time frame since we cannot afford to treat every single trigger point thus it is never enough to emphasize the importance of localization and targeting in terms of localization i've been applying cyrex method for tendinosis and stacos functional examination for myofascial problem all the time in addition to the Dr. Daniel's previous excellent lecture, please note how to localize and target for tendinosis. There are 12 functional examinations. This slide demonstrates for the localization in deltoid muscle. Localization in adductor muscles. Localization in infraspinatus muscle. Localization in subscapularis muscle. To understand Stekos' concept of facial manipulation, first, let's take a closer look at the fascia. We have found fascia, especially superficial fascia, has over 10 times more sensory receptors than muscle. Please keep in mind that it is another sensory organ. Let me tell you some interesting article. As a result of injecting hypotonic saline into each layer of subcutis, fascia, and muscle of patient with low back pain, the thoracolumbar fascia layer caused the most severe pain. According to Carlos Stigl's theory, hyaluronic acid in the deep fascia facilitates the free sliding of two fibrous fascial layers. When a problem arises here, myofascial pain occurs. Antonio Steco said, when viscosity of hyaluronic acid increases at a point called center of coordination, the sliding system in the center of coordination decreases. Ultimately, symptoms arise at the center of perception. As seen in these ultrasound images of patients with low back pain, compared to the normal, it shows that the fascia sliding system is clearly disrupted. Now, it's time to introduce radial pressure wave treatment technique using Stecco's facial manipulation concept. With the intention of eliminating facial densification using radial pressure wave device, in addition to compression, to back and forth, and even rotation, the concept of friction is the core of radial pressure wave technique. Here is an interesting study published in 2018, which is applied in the shock wave of Stekos concept to treat the frozen shoulder by applying radial pressure wave only. It has brought favorable outcome by setting treatment points for humerus, scapula, and arm according to the sequence concept. In the case of shoulder pain patients, as all muscles are always within the continuous fascial sheath, it is a principle to check the arm and form together with the scapula as a treatment point according to the movement. CC points in scapula segment. When shrugging a shoulder, in case of complaints of pain in sternoclavicular area or AC joint area, the lesion located medial to deltoid pectoral circus below the coracoid process is the center of coordination where densification are found frequently. Next, when the pain occurs in the position where both the scapula come together, CC point is located halfway between C7 and the scapula spine here. If there is a pain at the time of adduction, there is a center of coordination located anterior to the axillary line while 
posterior to the pectoralis major border here. In case the pain occurs in the trapezius region during abduction, the point from the anterior border of the descending trapezius towards the posterior scaling is center of coordination. When sternoclavicular joint pain occurs during horizontal abduction, the middle one third subclavius of clavicle becomes center of coordination. If pain is observed during scapular upward rotation, the scapular thoracic rhythm is disrupted, and then the scapular superior angle, in other words, levator scapular insertion site becomes center of coordination. Please remind these center of coordinations of scapular segments. If pain occurs during flexion when shaking hands, the short head of biceps attached to the coracoid process, located just below the deltoid anterior fiber, and the fascia of coracobrachialis becomes center of coordination. As a sequence treatment principle, if you check the midline to the lateral part of the biceps belly, treat it all together. The outcome of treatment is very effective. When pain occurs in extension, the location of the infraspinatus fossa at the intersection of ascending trapezius and posterior border of the deltoid attached to the scapular spine becomes center of coordination. It will be the best point for treating frozen shoulder patients with limited extension and internal rotation. The lateral head of the triceps should also be identified and treated with the longitudinal sequence. <coughs> if anterior shoulder pain appears in this position, center of coordination is the location of crocobrachialis in the proximal one-third of the medial intermuscular septum extension. When treating more than 500 shots with radial pressure wave, along with distal one third of medial intermuscular septum and resolving densification, you will get the best treatment outcomes. When lateral deltoid pain appears during abduction, if the pain spreads to the lateral epicondyle or trapezius area, center of coordination is the lateral bundle of the deltoid in the extension of the lateral intermuscular septum of the arm. If anterior pain appears during internal rotation, the clavicular part of the deltoid, that is, circus at the intersection of anterior deltoid and pectoralis major, becomes center of coordination. Performing the treatment can be improved by treating pronator teres muscle corresponding to the sequence. It is a good tip for the treatment point, so please make yours. Lastly, if posterior lateral pain appears during external rotation, such as a hair brushing posture, the posterior margin of the lateral deltoid will be center of coordination. This is the most important slide you should never forget. Let me show you demonstration. The target is the circus at the intersection of the anterior deltoid and pectoralis major muscle. I usually use 0.3 to 0.5 bar and 15 Hz as frequency. The technique is combination of compression, back and forth, and rotation. As using my own weight, it is easy to apply compression force in order to resolve densification. Next target is lateral bundle of deltoid muscle. I usually use 1000 to 1500 shots in a target point. Please check range of motion after treatment. In addition, as a sequence treatment, lateral intermuscular septum is good target as well.
Thank you for paying attention to my lecture so far. If you have any comments, opinions, or questions to point out, please send me a message. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for hearing this interesting video from uh, Dr. Park. Uh, I would continue this, um, this webinar with uh, a, a case that uh, Dr. Ram Chimbadabram from uh, India is going to show us. And after this, we can continue with the discuss. And I ask everybody in the audience if they can put questions in the chat. Thank you very much. Please, Ram, uh, tell us what is your case. Okay, Th thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, I will yeah. see perfectly. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for your kind invitation uh, to this August meeting and also uh, offering me honorary fellowship of your uh, federation. I'm very happy with that. Uh, to learn more and uh, about the shockwave therapy. I have been using uh, shockwave therapy as a mode of treatment for selected patients, both in my UK and Indian practice. And uh, I just wanted to share one case, which has been recently treated. Um, it's a 57 year old uh, homemaker lady uh, presenting with pain in the left shoulder after lifting water pot uh, one week ago. She had some pre-existing mild pain for six months, but no limitation prior to this now has severe difficulty in activities of daily living, continuous pain, night pain, sleep disturbed, unable to look after herself, do any work, had NSAID for one week, but no good result. So that was her range of movement. I just wanted to show this uh, case as a uh, case to demonstrate. So that is her right shoulder. That is her affected left shoulder. Abduction is hardly 30, 40. Passive is also painful. That's a range of uh, external rotation. And that's the, she couldn't reach even to uh, hip or sacroiliac joint. So that is her x-rays. <coughs> so uh, was what we were discussing before extensive uh, calcium deposit, uh, but some of them are clearly modulated, but some of them look fragmented. Remember the history dating back to one year uh, ago, uh, six months prior to as well. Uh, should we just take a, uh, some opinion about the classification? Do you use any classification? And what about any investigation? Uh, Daniel, in your practice? Thank you, Ram. Uh I see that uh, this patient, I, I would like to check the passive range of motion just to know if the limitation of movement is uh, related to pain or she has a, a, a frozen shoulder, you know, just yeah. not only the, the active. Uh, what I see in, on the x-ray are mainly two things. One is the calcification that for sure is not a type one Gern uh, calcification. Uh, yes. Perhaps the <laughs> acute pain that she is feeling is related to the reabsorption of, of this calcification. And I also see <clears throat> that there is a kind of drop in shoulder, perhaps related with the uh, limited range of motion and uh, atrophy of the muscles. But uh, my first goal in this patient would be to control pain. Uh, I think that that's the main point for me. Yeah, but she didn't have any uh, major pain or limitation of function prior to this. Uh, so I take your point. Uh, Sergio Rovinsky, what, what will be your thought? Well, uh, just just a second. Uh, I'm not seeing myself, so but but I I'm not seeing myself, but. Uh, can you see me? Can you listen to yes, me? We, yes, we can yes, see yes. you. Yes. Yes. Okay, lovely. So one thing that we, well, I'm not seeing myself, but this is not a problem. So one thing that we have to understand is that everything starts with, uh, with clinics, okay? So all of the time, I, I, I need to do a clinical rationale in my mind before seeing any exam. So the thing is, it's a 57-year-old lady with pain, 
in the left shoulder for six months. And now I would say a well-defined uh, trauma in time and space is not a high energy trauma, but it's uh, uh, trauma. And after the trauma, a, a very big dif uh, difficulty to elevate the arm actively. So until proven contrary, from a clinical point of view, that would be uh, a subacromial disease that yes. evolved to, a, to a, a rotator cuff tear uh, and the physical exam resembles that. So we have an association with the clinical history and the physical exam. So having said that, every, well, I, I would like to know all of the, the examination regarding rotator cuff specific tests, uh, if possible, of, of course, everything starts with the an, an X-ray in which we have this interesting finding that maybe this can be considering that clinics is sovereign and innocent bystander. And having said that, once I have to confirm or rule out a rotator cuff tear, an MRI is absolutely elemental for me to establish the, the proper diagnosis. Uh, uh, take your point, Karsten. Uh, would you do any further investigation here? Because clinically it's difficult to assess the rotator cuff in a painful presenting shoulder uh, with a limitation of movement uh, to this extent. Would you be concerned about the rotator cuff integrity at this stage? Definitely, yes. And this is why an MRI, uh, it's a very important exam in, at, this, at this moment, okay? okay. So from a, yeah. from a clinical point of view, I have a very typical, very typical subacromial scenario. We see this every day in the office, and then we have this interesting image. So I, I am seeing the CT, but yes. I still think that uh, because see, our, our what happened? pathology must be confirmed or rule it out. Hmm. What happened? This patient was treated elsewhere for the first week. The patient had this in, uh, sort of lifting water pot and then developing pain. So the treating surgeon at that place thought that is a GT fracture. Okay. And he <laughs> he okay, got the CT yeah. scan. I just wanted yeah. to show it. Uh, but yeah. my question to uh, Professor Karsten uh, the block, uh, would you do MRI to necessarily uh, investigate this rotator cuff pathology here? I usually opt to use the ultrasound first for for a thorough look however okay. especially if, if it's uh, that's my approach so i always do ultrasound and then for a confirmation of my ultrasound and my clinical examination i sure. would opt for an mri uh, at best because you know in germany it's, it, for me it's quite easy to have a three tesla uh, yeah. mri within two three days in a given patient if i if I'm not that sure on my ultrasound alone, and this might be the case in shoulder, then I would proceed to MRI. That's how I would do it. Yeah, I, I agree with that point. But I think for the listening audience, they have to remember uh, spec, specs of microscopic small classific classification may be sometimes missed by MRI, as right. well as uh, hypo echoic or isoechoic uh, lesion could be missed on the ultrasound. But right. in a large deposit, a MRI ultrasound is useful. Uh, so this is the classification just to highlight. Uh, so this is the uh, French orthoscopic classification adding a yeah. fourth element. And that's the Bosworth classification type three, more than 1.5 centimeter. So this is the clinical parameter. Uh, how do you proceed? What is your choice? First choice, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay. Is Sanjay there? What, what will be your first uh, uh, move? Uh, steroid injection, ESWT, needle aspiration, barbitage, orthoscopy? Uh, okay, I think it's... Uh, can, can you hear, Sergey? Yes, please. I do, I do have some difficulty in hearing, sorry about okay. that. So yeah, what would I do? Um, I don't know why I try um, as far as I got this, um, that should be maybe a possibility for a uh, shockwave, but I'm, I'm not so sure about the MRI results that, that you uh, uh, thought 
uh, or discussed because I did not hear as much. Media aspiration, well, no, I don't like that so much. Um, the arthroscopy would be um, uh, too early. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ram, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. Let, let me tell you something. Uh, generally, with these cases i well i i want i would like to know if the limited range of motion is also passive sure or it, it i is, think is it, it, i had a video but i didn't uh, uh, put that here for lack of time but that is the my examination it shows only a slight increase about 10 to 20 degrees more flexion Good. abduction than this uh, range Good. of movement Good. She, so, I, I gathered that she had some small limitation of the movement prior to this injury, but it has become worse for the past one week. Okay. So uh, my point of view with a case like this is that the patient was dealing with a calcification of her rotator cuff uh, sure. before the, those six months where she was having a slight range of motion. A, a slight limitation of the range of motion and some middle, uh, some pain, not not big pain, and what one week uh, earlier uh, before you met her, she began with a, an acute pain, perhaps related with that very uh, oh. yes minor trauma, minor effort more than trauma, but. Yeah. It seems yeah. to me that this could be that she's going on an acute resorption phase. So sure. In, sure. in my uh, office, what I do is my first goal is to uh, control pain. I can ask the patient an MRI, but I am not uh, concerned about the possibility of a rotator cuff. If she has a rotator cuff, I will evaluate that, but it's not an emergency to diagnose sure. not of a rotator cuff. So what I would do is to medicate this patient, I would, as I said, give corticoids, uh, intramuscular corticoids, and um, just ask for an MRI, check the, the evolution. Rockwood used to say that the four steps for treating uh, shoulder pain conservatively is first, control pain, second, recover range of motion, third, recover strength. And this patient, as I told you, she has a drop in shoulder because she has an atrophy of the muscles. And four is uh, to maintain the, uh, the exercises for a long time. Sure. Uh, so yeah. my first uh, approach yeah. to this patient would be conservative treatment. Yes. We, we, uh, uh, can I make he a, a, had, a point? He I had think? been, uh, just to uh, add information, she had been having uh, analgesic, injection, everything for last one week and is still persisting with pain with limitation of movement. So the yeah. treatment has been initiated by the treating surgeon for one yeah. week. Yes, but sir, Sergio. The point, no, no. Sorry, the point is that one week is a very short time for shoulder in this condition. You, you would need to expect and the, to communicate the patient that she will have pain for a longer time and the, ta the, the, the time will help her. But uh, you will not resolve this during just one week. Okay. Sure. Uh, Ham, okay. Can, can, can I make just one comment? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. So see, I learned it in medical college almost 25 years ago, and now I teach my residents this idea, which is a concept. There is no proper treatment without a proper diagnosis. So once the clinic is sovereign, I still have, in my point of view, to rule out, in spite of the radiographical image, the presence of not of a cuff pathology. It means a tear. So before, uh, I know uh, we have to manage pain, but I still have to establish, as all of the cases in my life, the diagnosis. So having said that, an MRI seems elemental to me to define the diagnosis. No proper management without a proper diagnosis. This is a message for the juniors, and I think that this, is, this makes sense in my mind. 
but this uh, I agree that with that point. But can we make like as a must uh, MRI for calcific tendinosis because it's a radiological diagnosis from X-ray it tells you that it is a calcific tendonitis that is part of the tendon uh, is becoming into calcium. So there is there might be that except no, that and, there is a, a issue with the rotator cuff dysfunction could be that could be also a tear. Sure. The, I think, uh, can we make a statement say that you must have MRI or not? We'll get opinion from Dr. Leonardo Gillow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yes, what please, I, I would like to say something. First, uh, uh, I agree with both. I agree with <laughs> Percio that with, yes, I agree with you because I think that the good diagnosis is a good treatment. So it's very important to know everything. But I agree also with Ram that if we have a calcium deposit, we, sure. can, uh, we can see if that calcium deposit is in what phase of the reabsorption. We, ha we must never do shockwaves when a, 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 a calcium deposit is in reabsorption in phase three of Gardner or even mm -hmm. in phase two, in, in grade two. So in that case, uh, that is with an uh, acute pain, I should think that is in a reabsorption in that moment. So I have to have to do something for the pain and for sure. the inflammation. After yes. this, yes. I would like to know if this woman have also a problem in his in the, in the tendon rotator cap. And if she mm -hmm. have some uh, rupture, I have to act in that way, looking the 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 the, the, the this rupture what is the size and deciding what to do after that. But first sure. of all, sure. first of all, I will act in the absorption and never do shockwaves in this case. So both, I agree with both. I think that everything is very important. Leonardo, so, Ram, let me say one thing. I, would ne I wouldn't do uh, shockwaves and I wouldn't operate this patient even if she's having a rotator cuff tear because if I operate a patient with that limited range of motion, I will have a bad result. Yes. So I, you need to have a, a strategy and say, okay, let's sure. go step by step. First of all, let's put some, you know, stop the fire here, stop the pain, stop the sure. uh, work on the range of motion. And then we will see, we can always ask an MRI and I can always operate on this patient because it's not an emergency not to, an emergency. Uh, to repair the rotator cuff. And there is something so clear and so obvious, uh, uh, the calcification, that I first want to uh, address that and then I have time to move on uh, to, to the repair of the rotator cuff if it is necessary. Sure. Uh, the, the MRI yeah. rule See, out I, that. I think uh, going through the surgical route is absolutely not necessary because if you excise all these calcium, you will be resulting in a defect or a tear which you need to repair. It's more disability, we agree. Uh, but as regard to the timing of uh, shockwave in a patient presenting with a uh, uh, pain in the calcific recurring episode, uh, how long is your waiting time? Or in the x-ray, if you look at it, it is not completely resorptive stage at all. It is just fragmented, dense calcification with the starting of physical symptoms. So what will be your timing? Would you, uh, how long you would wait? Ram, I think this is not a, a type two Gerner. It's not a, a type 3. For me, it's a type 2.8 Gerner. Oh, yes. uh, <laughs> calcification will resolve. is is a, a diffuse. Uh, it, it is expanding, something that we see frequently. So I think that time, time will be uh, the most important treatment for this patient. As we say, chronotherapy. Uh, so... I just want to uh, give the patient control of pain, perhaps very, very, uh, you know, soft exercises and follow up here. Okay. And if so, you take x in one month, you will be surprised that most of the calcification would have disappeared. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, just for the <laughs> lack of time, 
I'll just show yes. uh, how I did for this patient because I saw that's quite a lot of uh, dense uh, uh, fragments still there. I know that is maybe starting of the resorptive phase, but uh, as uh, uh, demonstrated in uh, Dr. Daniel Moyo's lecture, even though you have a resorptive uh, symptom, symptomatic stage starts, and if you give ESWT, it will control the pain as well as speed up the process. Sure. So that is something to uh, think about. Uh, yes. managing pain after one week of intensive treatment. So uh, I just uh, uh, did an ultrasound guided marking of the spot with uh, ESWT. Uh, I usually use a, a focused uh, uh, shockwave, but because of the pandemic situation, it was done with the radial uh, uh, shockwave in my clinic. Ice pack application immediately after, simple analgesics only, mobilization as comfortable, and uh, muscle strengthening after three weeks. So this is her at uh, exactly 18 days after the first episode. So three weeks later, please. it... Ram, stop yes. there, please, because it's very interesting. It put that, 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 that uh, x-ray. You see there that you have in the bursa, the calcium, yes. that what you're telling is that reabsorption spontaneously. I don't think that SVT can uh, did anything here. You, your patient were doing uh, spontaneously reabsorption and you have there the proof that that was doing. So I don't, the problem is that this woman with or without shockwaves would reabsorb everything because he was in the, in the reabsorption phase. And very, that, that uh, x-ray is very interesting. Excuse me that I uh, apologize that I uh, <laughs> ask you this, but... Yes, this is a spontaneous, spontaneous reabsorption. Uh, Ram, can, that... can, I would like to say something. Yes, please. Yeah, so as a shoulder surgeon, there is something very interesting in this case, and I'm going to mention the fact, and I'm going to do some inferences. If you see the, pre, the, uh, the first X-ray, the umeroacromial space was enlarged which is something that resembles rotator cuff suffering. And now with this current X-ray, the umeroacromial space is normal. So that gives me enough space from a physiopathological point of view to make the inference that that posterior superior rotator cuff was suffering somehow, okay? And now it's better. So from it's a better. physiopathological point of view, if the diagnosis is a calcific tendonitis, it was having a mechanical reflex on the posterior superior cuff, which is resolved now. This is interesting, and I think that this is very real. Dr. Daniel, do you agree with my, my inferences that I just have said? Yes, I completely agree, and I think this is a very nice case uh, because show us a, a, a kind of border situation in sure. which uh, no one would uh, criticize um, RAM for doing the, sure. the, the application because it also had a kind of, as we see frequently, analgesic, um, you know, analgesic function and the, help the patient, but uh, we must also state that this was a resorption phase. Uh, and we Sorry. can see how the things can change that dramatically uh, sure. if we wait for some time. But uh, you should, uh, you should, I think the key message is also you should certainly avoid jumping to do some invasive procedure on seeing that presentation in the first phase having somebody seeing with uh, six months calcific tendonitis coming with symptoms, acute pain. Sometimes some surgeons jump to do interventional uh, intervention or uh, unnecessary arthroscopic intervention. Yes. So, then you could wait, uh, it let it settle down and then you can plan the, your treatment. Or of course, uh, shockwave as an adjuvant therapy as well to speed up the process of resolution. Uh, second yeah. is to get good pain control. Because this lady uh, had complete disappearance of pain with the shockwave therapy and required only paracetamol as the analgesic. And it also allowed her to do with the rehab. In three weeks, she could regain full movement, including rotation. You know, um, uh, oh, 
sorry, Excuse images. Me, yes, I, sorry, no. images can give you a lot of information, and images are showing me that perhaps uh, I feel that Germany is going to play soccer soon. Isn't that right, Karsten? So they I, already I think... play ten minutes. That's why I'm okay. already, you know. You, and it's you a see why game. Images, images <laughs> and I have guesses, you know, that's why. Showing. So <laughs> we must consider images, and I think we should free our friends uh, to watch the, the, the game, Leonardo. I ah. think we are on time. Uh, uh, Dr. Park, what, want to say something? Yeah, Dr. Um, Park. I actually completely agree with uh, Daniel's opinion before. And uh, let me tell my opinion for Dr. Ram. You know, in this case, okay. um, the first priority is to remove the pain, right? But even if after removing the pain, the range of motion remains still, my strategy is to make manipulation on the brachial plexus block. Okay. What about your opinion? I agree with you, Park. Is pain, movement, right. strength, and maintenance. Do, do I completely agree problem? with you. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Dr. Park, can I make a statement? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I agree with all that everybody have said. I am net, not a, a narrow-minded guy. On the contrary, I am an open-minded guy, but I stick to concepts all of the time. We are talking about management, but I still have to rely on diagnosis. Right. So, I, And I am right. So maybe if there is stiffness after the, the hydrographical disappearance of the calcification, that would be a secondary frozen shoulder, okay? Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. And having said that, what I do and what Dr. Daniel does, because we discussed this in a previous webinar in, in September, is many times suprascapular nerve blocks, and mm -hmm. they have been mm -hmm. extremely successful to me. So we always have to think, I, I'm sorry I am being harsh, but I, I have reason to support my straightness. In, uh, besides all of the management, we have always to focus or in diagnose or in diagnosis on the singular, on the plural, because I'm sorry, no proper diagnosis, no proper management. I am, right. extremely, I am ab absolutely straight to, to this concept. And I dare to say that I am not incorrect in all of this straightness. All right. Excuse me, uh, dear conferences, but I think that in honor of time, we have to make only a couple of, of questions to the other conferences. Uh, thank you, Ram, for this case that is very, very interesting. I think thank you. every case and every discussion here may uh, be a future webinar. I hope that that could happen. The important thing is that everybody of us know that we can start with, uh, with treatments without, uh, without make any invasion in the body. We have to have ex an excellent uh, diagnosis in all of the cases. If not, we, we can continue. And sure. I think that the, uh, the order of these treatments and of this uh, uh, form of seeing the patients is very important for every people that is starting. So. There are some questions that, in, that are in the chat that have been done in between us, but there are some very interesting questions. For example, for uh, Karsten, uh, you have tell us about tendosinovitis and about Dupuytren, but there is some, in my experience also, very difficult tendosinovitis, that is the Kervin, that have less good, uh, less good uh, result when we use uh, physical energies in the place. What is your experience with the Kerben? Uh, is is necessary to do this first or we have to uh, do surgery when we uh, have these cases? 
in actually uh, in 2006 already, 15 years ago, I made a paper for the ESCA journal where we did as, um, power Doppler ultrasound on the decorons and could show the very same neo vessels like in Achilles tendinopathy right at the origin of the first extensor channel, I would say, you know? So it is kind of entrapment problem plus inflammation. And at that point of time, I did uh, sclerosing injections and shock waves and it disappeared. Um, if it comes to shock waves focused and radial wise in terms of energy, this is, if it's, it is very, very painful. And if you, for example, do radial pressure wave therapy with two bars with a steel applicator, this is not possible because it's too painful. So I am using the silicone tip from Storz. It's a, uh, it's a silicone, uh, let's say, device you mount on your radial device. And I adjust my pressures like Park in Seoul does at 0.3 or 0.5 bar, very, very low. This is not possible with every machine, I know, but very, very low and with the silicon. And then I go 2000 shots over the, uh, over the um, extensor tendon, plus uh, do additional focus with very low energy again, 0 0.03, 0 0.05. So you have to somehow adjust your shock waves to this very painful location. That's the same holds true for trigger fingers. However, the converse is even more painful, maybe the most painful spot you can imagine. So that's how, how I approach it. So same, 10 uh, shock waves. By now I do e the magnetic uh, field. I did prior in the, uh, the past years, laser therapy and, mo uh, and uh, injection therapy with polydocanol sclerosing or hyaluronic acid. That's how I approach it. And, um, and, and, and the, uh, let's say the open uh, release, it's let's say I do it once or twice in a year. So okay. not that often. I see one, two patients a day with the cover. So not that okay. often. Perfect. Perfect. The other conferences has the same experience that like Karsten in this pathology. What do you think, Bram, about uh, using this type of techniques in the Decker van? You used to use it also? Oh, uh, I have I have no experience in using decorants. Uh, okay, only conservative injection surgical treatment. I have not tried uh, shock wave that at all. Uh, but I'm very impressed by uh, Kasten's result on scaphoid non-union. Yeah, okay. with, with such a gap. Um, yeah. Because you know, I would have done uh, revised that uh, because I do hand surgery as well. I, I would have revised that thinking that non-union needs compression, you know, headless screw, etc. But yeah. uh, my question is, how much gap you could accept if you are successful in healing with shockwave? I therapy? would say, if it comes to an acute scaphoid fracture, first goal is reposition and fixation, as usual. So. Mm -hmm. Do a Herbert screw. We are now talking on non-union, so I would not mix the acute assessment. Although you know I'm a big fan of shockwave and uh, can do everything. However, even if I would have an acute B2 type scaphoid fracture, I would receive a Herbert screw. You know, yes. but if then it fails before considering a uh, bone graft. And I did even when I was in hospital, I did vascularized bone grafts from a radial. So very yes. sophisticated yeah. microsurgical things, you know. And even then I have a case where it does not heal. And I did three sessions of focus shockwave and then it healed, you know. So in the non-union situation or in the ex uh, prolonged healing situation, not waiting six months, but maybe four or let's say two months, two, uh, eight weeks after your acute operation and then no real healing. Or if you, for example, have a diabetic patient osteoporosis okay. or some other exactly. risk factors where you say it's prone to develop problems, I would consider even doing it immediately after surgery. So there is one study from, not published yet from Japan on metatarsal five Jones fractures. And they did focus shockwave after a screw at day one, three and five, and here were four weeks faster back on field in Japanese soccer players. So I would consider 
adding shock waves immediately after surgery for an even enhanced bone acceleration healing and like my magnetic field now. So that's how I would concert, but still, and I'm trained surgeon still, you know, so surgical indications remain surgical indication regardless of the beauty of the shockwave machine. Okay. I think Park. especially that, that aspect Excuse me, Park, even, Park is it. Yeah. Excuse me, Ram. Park is yeah, is, yeah. Is, let me let me something what? interesting for Ram, Dr. Ram. You know, actually I have uh, experience uh, translating um, Dr. Karsten's great book, Hand Surgery in ESWT into Korea. So uh, the outcome is very, very effective, you know, because I really just follow his uh, strategy, all right? So just believe him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for the graphic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The outcome is very, very effective. Believe proof, it. Proof is, it in, <laughs> proof is in the puddings. He's showing the result. <laughs> uh, Dr. Leo, can I, can I make a, a question to everybody? Yes. But the last one, please, because we are on time. The last have, one. Uh, okay. The last one. Question. Last yes. one. I am asking everybody because I don't do shock waves. Dr. Daniel knows I am a shoulder and elbow surgeon who does a lot of shoulder and elbow trauma in my public hospital. And I operate a lot of cases and I treat many cases non-operatively. Having said that, when I'm managing a, a mid-shaft clavicle fracture conservatively, and I am having the perception in timeline from a chronological point of view and a radiographical point of view that it may evolve to pseudoarthrosis because we know there is a gray zone in, in, in between formal bone healing and pseudoarthrosis. There is a gray zone radiographically and chronologically. In this gray zone, in mid shaft clavicle fractures, do you think there is a role for shock wave to impede pseudoarthrosis? It's a good question. I have, it's a good question. I have experience. Uh, the only problem, Sergio, is that the uh, lung vertex is very close to that area. Okay. That the subclavius artery is going very close to very close. the clavicle. So I have used a piezoelectric device that has a very a, a smaller focus than electrohydraulic device, and I have had good results. But I apply the shock waves tang tangentially, you know, just not direct. I trust to I try to go from the front and from anteriorly, just being very sure that I will not go through the the lung uh, structure. I totally agree. Daniel, yes, I, I like give you the, the, the most. Excuse me, Ram. Uh, only, 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 uh, uh, you, uh, only you thing that to I have get to say. A good point to get there in order yeah. not to harm yeah. lung tissue and vessels. In, but if you have a point where you can get there and your device is able to have a sm focus small enough, then it is a good uh, treatment option. Okay. Yeah. For the people, for the people that are beginning, because there are some people that is beginning. Two th things that are very important that you have said uh, in, this, in this moment: we have to avoid the focus shock waves in every part where these shock waves can produce some risk. For example, okay. yes. in where where you have air and you pass through the air with an energy that can explode inside the air, such a lung, such a digestive uh, apparatus, you have to avoid to put shock waves there. That is okay. uh, absolutely contra a, a, a contraposition of this treatment. Never do that. So what Daniel is saying, we can treat a clavicle, uh, a clavicle uh, fracture, but if you are pointing to the lung, you will kill your patient. So oh, never, okay. never, yes, never do that. And uh, that is very important for the people that are beginning this. Uh, the contraindications, the most contraindications in the form we do, the, 
the shock waves, the focus shock waves, and even even uh, also the radial pressure waves. You have to be very careful in, in that. I think that for the people that is beginning, is very important what you're telling. Uh, 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 Ram, I think that you want to say something about this. Only one question to uh, Dr. Park Wangsan. Uh, any experience in treating stiff elbow with uh, shockwave? Any experience? Sir, Dr. sir. Park. Yeah. Park, you are mute. Yeah, Dr. Park. You are mute. Uh, yes, sorry. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, in case of frozen shoulder, my strategy is um, the first thing is injection. All right. So as I said before, um, after confirming uh, the origin of um, a limited uh, range of motion is pain or real primary frozen shoulder, we have to find uh, the first three, all right? So nextly, um, my strategy is a manipulation after uh, brachial plexus block. Okay. And then the remains of range of motion could be improved completely by shockwave, as I said in my lecture. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think that if, uh, in honor of time for the audience also, I, I will, uh, I, I only have to uh, say uh, to everybody of you, thank you very much for this evening, morning, and afternoon that you have made a sacrifice to today to, to be with us. But it's a pleasure to have been with everybody of you. Thank you. We have learned a lot. And I hope we could have in Onlet people so interesting as you are in the future. Thank you, Dr. Moya, for sending, lending us this uh, AutoWeb channel also, and for your presence and say, bye-bye to everybody of you and invite to the people that are audience today to the next uh, webinar that will be in the, in the lower limb uh, with short waves, the lower limb treatment and uh, have a nice weekend and thank you very much and bye-bye to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have to go thank sleeping. You. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Oh, Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night Park. Uh, right, you're then. great. You are a hero. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to Orto TV. And I Thank think you. that if Dr. Ashok agrees, he's the boss here. Uh, I yeah. think this is a very nice team. And we, we should have a second round during the year. Uh, because there are many questions, many topics. And I think it would be great to be all together again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Orso bye TV. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Orso bye. TV. Well done, Daniel. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you, you can stop the streaming, Jenny. Okay. Jagan,